It was only when I collapsed in Manchester and I saw a, um, a registrar in A&E who was just like, you know, there's something going on here. And I want you to see my consultant because I don't know what it is, but he's really interested in cardiology issues that don't quite fit the, the norm. My name's Dr. James O'Donovan. I'm a medical doctor and online health educator. I'm going to meet Loretta McInnes, who was diagnosed with Fabry disease in 2015 after being symptomatic for over 40 years. Loretta and I first met online earlier in 2025 when I came across her amazing website, My Fabry Disease, where she documents her experiences of living with this rare genetic condition. I've been doing some research into rare diseases and, amongst other conditions, came across Fabry disease. Now, admittedly, even as a doctor with over 10 years of clinical experience, I'd only read about Fabry disease in textbooks during medical school and heard about it through some case reports. But in all honesty, because it's classed as a rare disease, it was never a condition that was at the front of my mind in my day-to-day -day clinical practice. But it's thought there are actually 3.5 million people living with a rare disease in the UK alone, which is why it's so important to be aware of them, including Fabry disease. In fact, the more I learned about Fabry disease, I realised that many of the symptoms were things that I'd encountered in clinical practice in patients who were often labelled as having multiple unexplained symptoms. And importantly, I learned women are not just carriers of Fabry disease, but can be affected by it just as seriously as men, something which has been misunderstood historically. So, in an effort to learn more about Fabry disease, I've come to spend some time with Loretta to hear her story. So what is Fabry disease? So Fabry disease is classed as a rare disease and affects males and females. Which gene is affected in Fabry disease? The gene that's affected with Fabry disease is the GLA gene and that's on the X chromosome. And if it is affected, it will the variation will result in the lack of a production of a certain enzyme. That enzyme is called the, the alpha GLA enzyme, which is alpha galactosidase. And that enzyme is, is responsible for getting rid of a glycolipid called GB3 or GL3. That glycolipid is a fat, and that fat causes the problems in Fabry disease because it can build up in different organs in the body. It affects various organs, so it can affect the brain, it can affect the skin, the kidneys, the heart, and causes things like lack of ability to sweat, um, LVH, which is less left ventricular hypertrophy, um, kidney failure. Okay, so that's really helpful, and it has given me a good idea as to the symptoms could be quite wide ranging, mm -hmm. and it can also mean that's why the diagnosis of Fabry could be slightly delayed in some people. Loretta, can you tell me about your first signs and symptoms that you experience? Looking back now, my, my initial signs in childhood were very typical of Fabry. Mm. So if I ever got ill, if I ever got a virus, I would have really horrendous pains in my hands and feet. I, I would scream with the pain, that's how bad it was. My mum took me to the doctors, and the doctor said it was growing pains. Mm. So you just get on with it. You know, you take some paracetamol and you hope it goes away. But it was it was horrendous. I can still remember mm. the intensity of the pain. Mm. Um, and I didn't really have any other symptoms that I would call Fabry symptoms until I was in my early 20s. And I started getting some issues with chest pain, angina. Um, and when I was first pregnant with my first child, my GP thought there was a problem with my heart and sent me away to have some testing done. Um, interestingly, the cardiologist didn't even do an ECG. He just went, oh, you're too young to have heart problems. Off you go. And that was that. Right. And I do remember where, very early on, um, when I was wearing contact lenses, and up the, 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 the person examining me saying, oh, extraordinary, you've got some extraordinary, extraordinary um, patterns or something like that. Um, Again, didn't think anything of it, um, but now I know that corneal whorls, which are evident on your cornea and you can mm -hmm. see them through slip lamp tests, is a very common sign of Fabry disease. Right, that, that's fascinating because I actually didn't know that, uh -huh. so it's really helpful for me to know. Any other symptoms that people should be aware of in terms of anything to do with the kidneys or anything to well, do with like strokes? or? Absolutely, yeah. So, they were my early symptoms. Um, I've since had a potential TIA 
um, which I'm, I'm, I'm on treatment for now. Um, I've got issues with vessels in my brain, um, which again is thought to be down to Fabry. I don't have problems with my kidneys, but some people do. So how long did it take to get a diagnosis of Fabry disease? Well, it took me over 40 years to get my diagnosis. And that was after having the horrific pains in my hands and feet as a kid. Heart issues, LVH, which is very typical of Fabry. The corneal whirls, very typical of Fabry. Mm -hmm. And it was only after I had episodes of collapse and really severe heart issues that a consultant stood back, looked at all the issues that were going on with me over the years and joined those dots, gave me genetic testing and then Fabry disease was actually diagnosed. Wow. So as you've heard, there are lots of potential red flag symptoms for Fabry disease, but there are three that stand out for me most. Firstly, the abnormal pattern of the eye called cornea verticalata, which doesn't affect vision and can only be seen during an eye exam with a slit lamp. Now, I think this is interesting from a health professional's perspective because during routine eye exams, this could easily be picked up if an optometrist is aware of it. Secondly, as you heard from Loretta, neuropathy is a disabling and common feature of Fabry disease. Most describe it as continuous with exacerbations during illness and hot weather. Along with fatigue, neuropathic pain has a significant impact on quality of life, and it has been reported in female patients as young as four years old. And thirdly, it's important to be aware of heart problems, including arrhythmias, thickening of one of the left heart chambers called left ventricular hypertrophy, and heart failure, or even cerebrovascular issues such as strokes or TIAs. And importantly, when multiple symptoms are involved, and seemingly unconnected symptoms, so things like peripheral neuropathy, extreme pain during physical activity, dizziness, gastrointestinal problems, and abdominal pain, tinnitus, or even high levels of protein in the urine and edema, it's important to ask yourself, could it be Fabry? How did that delay in diagnosis make you feel? At the time, it, it, I didn't have any issue other than frustration because I knew there was something going on with me. I knew things were not right. I knew it wasn't all in my head. I knew there was something going on, but I didn't know what it was. Um, I didn't think it was genetic because nobody else in the family was having similar issues um, from a heart perspective. But I knew it was something. So I was frustrated, um, but I was relieved mm. when I finally got that diagnosis. If you did have a message, Loretta, to a healthcare professional watching this video, be it a doctor, a nurse, or an optometrist, what would that message be? Uh, well, I would say anything that's odd, you know, anything that doesn't fit the, the norm, um, ask yourselves, you know, could it be Fabry? So if it's something in the eyes that's odd, if you've got these corneal whirls, strange patterns, um, if there is unexplained LVH, unexplained heart issues, that there are no risk factors. So the big thing for me, I kept getting told I, was, I had no risk factors. That in itself was the risk factor. Right. So, you know, join those dots and, and ask yourselves, you know, could it be Fabry? This has been an incredible opportunity for me to learn from someone who is such an amazing advocate for others living with rare diseases. I think one thing that I'd reflect on is that as doctors, we do feel under immense pressure. But one of the most important things is to listen to the patient. And if they're presenting with multiple symptoms, ask yourself, could these conditions be connected? Could this be a rare disease? Could there be a genetic component underlying this? And could this be Fabry? Could it be Fabry?